Hello, this is my 122nd of mostly problem-solving videos for actuarial exam 2 and financial math. If you haven't watched video number 121, you should definitely watch that before this video where we do the same problem but part B of it. Now we're doing part A. Um, I went more slowly over the, the problem statement in that video. I'm going to go very fast over the problem statement in this video very fast overall, so you're definitely going to benefit if you watch video 121 first. In this video, something strange happens. We're after an internal rate of return for certain transactions for a line of credit account, and it's going to turn out that our internal rates of return, non-unique ones, are going to be complex numbers, non-real, involving the imaginary unit. Very, very strange. And what this is ultimately going to illustrate is that the internal rate of return is not really the most appropriate thing to use for all kinds of financial transactions, but it's kind of interesting to think about anyway, and I think it's worth thinking about this in this problem. So here is the problem statement. It's basically the same as last time, Smith having a line of credit account. The only difference is in this very last number here, this B2 is 1.33, whereas in the last video it was 1.32, barely different. Um, I'll let you read it all. I don't want to read it, really. Let me just focus on the fact that the A values that you see here are withdrawals from the line of credit. You can think of Smith as being over here. Stick figure for Smith. You can think of the line of credit account being right here. The A values are withdrawals. They are money going from the line of credit account to Smith so that he can spend the money. The Bs are payments. So Smith is depositing money, and we ultimately think of payments, since they're going away from Smith initially and are not necessarily readily available to him as negative amounts to Smith, and money coming back to Smith as being positive, which can be a little counterintuitive, but that's the way we're going to think about it. And in each of these situations, the key thing to, to calculate is the difference A minus B. There's going to be a C0 is A0 minus B0. 0 minus 1 is negative 1, representing a deposit of 1 into the line of credit account. It's negative 1 because it's going away from Smith to the line of credit account. C1 is really Smith borrowing money now. It's a positive quantity. It's 2.3 minus 0, which is 2.3. And C2 as being back to a negative quantity. A2 minus B2 is 0 minus 1.33 is negative 1.33. This does clear the outstanding balance, bringing it to zero at the end, okay? The goal is to solve for i, the internal rate of return per period. The period itself is not specified in three different ways. As before in the previous video, we'll do the first and third first and see that the second reduces to either the first or third approach. All right, I'm going to um, show you the equations to solve. Um, I'm not going to take the time to use the calculator in depth on those equations. I'll just write down the answers. You should take the time to pause the video and figure out those answers with your calculator on your own. Um, but for sake of time, since I've got a lot of other things I want to talk about in this video, I will not do that. So I could draw a number line. I'm not going to do that. Label is 0, 1, and 2, and write these amounts, negative 1, 2.3, and negative 1.3 on that line. On that line, the last one, again, being negative 1.33. If I evaluated at time zero, that means I'm discounting back to time zero. The negative one is already at time zero, so it does not get discounted. The 2.3 is one period ahead of time. It's positive. I put plus 2.3 .3, times the present value discount factor V. It's going back to time zero by one period. I told you I'm going fast here, so if this is too fast for you, watch the preceding one. The final amount, negative 1.33, is at time two, it's got to go back two periods of time, it gets multiplied by v squared, and this needs to come to zero so that the outstanding balance, as I said, is cleared to zero. Okay, and that would be the equation you'd solve. You can solve this with the quadratic formula. Let's go ahead and write down initially what you would write with the quadratic formula. If you don't remember the quadratic formula, go back and review it. Here is what you would write. Careful, the coefficient of the square term is not 1 or negative 1, it's negative 1.33. Okay, and ultimately what this would give you, when you simplify them, I'm just going to write it down here, is 0.86466165 plus or minus a square root of a negative number divided by a positive number. This quantity in here turns out to be negative. 
turns out to be negative 0 0.03. We're taking a square root of a negative number. That's not a real number. It's, it's an imaginary number. I'm going to let capital I represent the imaginary unit here because we've got a different meaning for little i. Little i is the most common thing to use for the imaginary unit. A number whose square is negative 1. Hmm, does such a number exist? Hmm. Well, we can define it to exist, so don't worry too much about the philosophical implications, though you might wonder whether it really is real, practical in real life. Anyway, if you finish finding these roots and take the square root of negative 1 and replace it by i, you'll get plus or minus approximately 0 0.06511469i. Okay, there's two ones there. I wrote them kind of close together. 0 0.06511469 times this imaginary unit i. That would be the two possible values for the present value discount factor, giving you two possible values for i, the internal rate of return, the yield rate, if you will. Take the reciprocal of this thing to find 1 plus i, where this is a lowercase i, which is going to represent our yield rate, our internal rate of return per period. It's 1 over v. And I'll just say the answer here turns out to be um, 1.15 plus or minus. And actually, if I use the plus root here, I get a minus root here. So I'll write it as minus plus. And actually, I could have write, written minus plus over here because of the negative sign there, but don't worry about it. 1.15 minus plus um, 0.08660254i is what you should get. Now, you can't do it as far as I know on a financial calculator. We could check this with a graphing calculator, though you can't use that on the exam. Uh, let me just approximate this number to see that this is approximately right. Let me go ahead and do 1 divided by, in parentheses, 0.8647, say. We'll take the plus, plus 0 0.06511, there's two ones there, times the imaginary unit i, which on a calculator is a lowercase i, down there and above the decimal, I do second decimal, that gives me an i there, which is the imaginary unit. Enter that, I get 1.14995, close to 1.15, minus, this is a plus up there, but you see a minus there, 0 0.0866. Yeah, so we're seeing that we're getting approximately the same thing here. You do see an I at the end. Okay. So that, yeah, I could subtract one from both sides to get the two possible internal rates of return. I'll go ahead and do that. 0.15 minus plus 0 0.08660254 times the imaginary unit. But weird, what does it mean? Okay, let's not worry about it for the moment. Uh, before we do the th Part three there, let's think about the graph of this function of v here. So I'll use my graphing calculator again. This first equation is essentially the equation you see here, this first function, using an x instead of a v. Here's a pretty good window to graph it over, and if you graph it, here's the picture you see. You see a quadratic, and it looks like maybe it does touch the axis, but if you zoom in, make the window smaller in the y direction, for example, like this, you will see that it actually does not touch the axis. There we go. It does not have any real roots. You've got no horizontal intercepts. So they are complex roots as we saw here. And the negative one in the previous video when it was negative 1.32, we did have two real roots. So just that slight change there caused us to go from having two real roots to two complex number roots. Again, we're not going to quite worry about the meaning yet. Let's do part three quickly. So now I want to evaluate at time two. I want to push things forward to time two. So the negative one's got to go forward in time by two periods. Multiply it times one plus i quantity squared, where, again, this lowercase i is the IRR. The 2.3 at time one needs to go forward by one unit of time to one plus i. Multiply times one plus i. And the negative 1.33 is already at time 2, so it stays as is. Set this equal to 0. You've got a quadratic equation in i, but better to think of it as a quadratic equation in 1 plus i. 
and use the quadratic formula. The numerator turns out to be the same as the preceding numerator, negative 2.3 plus or minus square root of 2.3 squared minus 4 times, okay, I think of the order is different here, but it is the same product in the end here. And you get the same numerator. The denominator is different, though. It's going to be 2 times negative 1 instead of 2 times negative 1.33. But I'm not solving for v here. I'm solving for 1 plus i. And in the end, this does give you approximately the same numbers that I got. No, not right there, but instead right here. 1.15 minus plus 0 0.08660254i. Same numbers. Okay, and I, after subtracting 1, would, would give you this. I guess these are the answers here, by the way. Two internal non-unique rates of return that are both complex numbers. Um, so you'd get the same answer. If you evaluate at time 1, the negative 1 needs to go forward by one unit of time. It's got to get multiplied by 1 plus I. The 2.3 is already at time 1. It stays as is and the negative 1.33 needs to go back in time by one unit of time, so it gets multiplied by v. But if you're going to solve this equation for i, or v, you need to convert it to one of these other two before using the quadratic formula. You can convert it to this one by multiplying everything by 1 plus i. You could convert it to this one by multiplying everything by v, which is the reciprocal of 1 plus i. All right, and you get the same thing. In the time we have remaining, I want to see if we can kind of make a little bit of financial sense out of this in some sort of imaginary universe where we could have money that could be in, have involve imaginary parts, complex numbers. Boy, I can't really imagine that happening, happening in our universe, but oh well, let's have fun with it anyway. So we have this initial amount for C0 is negative 1. That is money going from Smith to the account. He's depositing one unit of money. The account's balance would be positive 1, I guess, but to Smith, Smith is thinking of that negatively because the money's out of his hands. That negative 1, you could imagine, would grow, so to speak, with interest. It would get multiplied by 1 plus i. Let's go ahead and take the, uh, the one with the minus sign here. So I'm going to multiply this by 1.15 minus 0 0.08660254 times the imaginary unit I'm calling capital I to get me, um, I give me, I guess, negative 1.15 plus 0 0.08660254 times the imaginary unit, and that is correct. So that would be the balance, quote unquote, of <laughs> this way of thinking about things after one unit of time and before the new transaction amount of positive 2.3. Let's do that new transaction amount now. What happens now when I add 2.3 to this? Well, if you know about complex arithmetic, this is a real number. I'm adding it to a complex number. This could be thought of as 2.3 plus 0i if you prefer. You add the real parts and you add the imaginary parts. Negative 1.15 plus 2.3 is positive 1.15. <coughs> and then 0i plus that is that. 0.08660254i. Okay, weird. <coughs> but uh, let's just go with it. During the second period of time, I guess I need to multiply by the same growth factor again times 1.15 minus 0.08660254i. I should put these things in parentheses like that. Let's do this last transaction on the calculator, and I will use fewer decimal places to save a little time. All right, so take um, 0.08660254. Right, it's so uh, you know 1.15 plus 0 0.0866 times the imaginary unit, which is the little i here. Enter that. Multiply it times uh, in parentheses here times 1.15 minus 0 0.0866 times the imaginary unit. Whoops. Well, 
what do we get? We get about 1.33. Is there an imaginary part here? There doesn't seem to be. Yeah, the imaginary part is zero. Now with these approximations, you may not, well, okay, these are complex conjugates if you know about that. So that's, we're getting zero here for the imaginary part. We're getting close enough to 1.33 that I'm just gonna write 1.33. And lo and behold, look at that, 1.33 is the opposite of C2, negative 1.33. We're now going to subtract 1.33 to bring the balance to zero. How about that? So if we could make sense of non-real amounts of money, then this internal rate of return, these two things as complex numbers, I guess could make sense because we are getting back to a balance of zero. But boy, that... that that's not something I think we'd want to do in our actual financial system. To end the video real quickly, let's just do this on the, see what happens with the TI financial functions here with this problem. Go to the CF cash flow, enter negative one as the value of C0, enter it, tab down, C1, this is really C01, which is C1, is positive 2.3, enter it, tab down, frequency is one, keep that as is. C2 is negative 1.33, negative, enter it. What happens now if we calculate the IRR, internal rate of return, compute CPT? You wait and you wait and you wait and eventually an error comes up. Error seven, which basically means it's stuck in a, a loop that's not ending. And I'm not sure if that happens every time you have a complex root, but maybe it does. So it seems like calculator is not going to be helpful when using the financial functions for this kind of problem, but you probably would not have this kind of problem on an actual actuarial exam. But I hope you thought it was worthwhile anyway to see this amazing fact that you could think about this in terms of complex numbers if we allowed such monetary units.